Good morning, Revolution. <laughs> Everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Revolution. Good morning, Revolution. Michael, all of you, what's up with you? How are you? What's going on? Cold. Friday morning. I just got in from the doctor's office. It took longer than I thought it was going to take. But I'm here, and I'm good to go, and we're ready to roll. Well, uh, did anybody, um, uh, well, the president didn't give a speech this week, or did he? No, that was last week. But this week, they had to vote in the Senate. Anybody surprised? Michael, are you surprised? No, I'm no. not. What about you, Scott? Uh, no, not really. <clears throat> I mean, not really. Nothing unpleasant surprises me anymore coming out of uh, uh, out of the Senate. Anita, were you? I was surprised. Oh? I was surprised at, at how uh, easy it was for Kirsten Cinema to humiliate the president. You know, that was just I thought really uncalled for. But um, what did she do? That, she made a speech um, saying that she wasn't going to support any changes in the filibuster as President Biden was moving, was uh, heading to Washington to speak to uh, Congress about it. So uh, she sort of preempted him and said, I'm not, not there's no way I'm ever going to uh, support that. And, you know, she got a lot of uh, support from the Republican side because of her stubbornness and obstinacy. Yeah, of course she and, did. Of and course I'm sure did. when, um, when, it, it, in the future, if Mitch McConnell ever has a chance to take control of the Senate again, he would, um, you know, throw the filibuster out in a in a hot minute just to, you know, get his way. So in a New York minute. Rosanna, were you surprised? Unfortunately, no. Mm. I would have been surprised if they had passed something. They, you know, they moved closer, but no. But this, I mean, this this cuts to a. A point right of, of sort of our understanding of how the political process and the process of social change work right um marx calls it uh, par bourgeois parliamentarism or something or this this faith that um the needs of democracy the needs of the people uh can be met through the existing procedural forms of of bourgeois democracy um which is which is not the case. That doesn't mean we get we get rid of bourgeois democracy. It's it's a it's a bulwark against something even worse. But um, we can't just you know let the Senate uh, do its work. We can't trust the process. This has to be something. Voting rights is something that the working class fought to win. That people of color fought to win. That immigrants are fighting to win. That women fought to win. And the fight is not anywhere close to over on those things. Um, and, well, I was just going to say, so what do we do now? I mean, the Senate is tied 50-50. And, um, the, you know, the country's divided. Some say 50-50, some say 40-60. Some say two-thirds, one-thirds, but whatever it is, it's divided as all get out. So what do you do? I mean, there yeah. were marches. August 23rd, there was a march on Washington, and then the women marched on October the 3rd. Michael? Oh, I think it has to be that organizing and marching, but with the goal of ultimately electing people while we live on, you know, under capitalist democracy who aren't like cinema, who aren't like mansion, who get the job done, you know, who truly, you know, have uh, working people's interests at heart, you know, if that, and if that means electing a communist, whether it be at the local or national level, you know, that's that's what it's going to have to take. So we have to fight for that. I know the unions are pushing really hard um, for voting rights, same with the Poor People's Campaign. And so it's it's going to take, as Rosanna always says, these grassroots people's movements pushing and, and getting, you know, people like us elected uh, to be able to, to truly represent the interests of working people. Because as uh, Scott says, you know, you can't always count on um, bourgeois democracy uh, to do the work for us. It doesn't always work out that way. Well, I mean, well, Michael, I don't know. Are was people a... really pushing hard, uh, Rosanna. I mean, is the hard push coming, or is it people just sitting around? I mean, maybe they're concerned. They write letters to the editor, they write petitions, but what's it going to take? It's going to. I think it's going to take um, showing people that there is. There is hope. There is that ability to, 
to make the change and that we have the power of it, of it. So whether it takes, you know, really hitting the streets hard, uh, getting um, people out with the message, uh, showing people through struggle that, you know, we, we as workers have the ultimate power. It's a process. It's not going to, it does, just doesn't happen overnight. It's not a, this isn't a TV show that, you know, in 30 minutes problems are solved. It's a process that unfortunately has its ups and downs. Scott, so do you know going. that, I'm sorry, Rosanna, finish your thought? No, I just say, we just have to keep going. Let's not get, you know, disillusioned, it, it, you know, otherwise we, we've already lost. Scott, the 1965 Voting Rights Act was placed before the Congress three times before it passed. Yep. Three times yeah. before it passed. So um, it's got to be put the second time. And it's then pushed as many times as is necessary. And I think Michael's point about the labor movement was really, really key because there are two fundamental democratic uh, fights that are intertwined. One is uh, the right for the right to political democracy, the right to to vote, the right to be able to run for office, to hold office, um, and the other is the right to workplace and economic democracy. And ultimately, those converge, right, in socialism. But right now, uh, we're fighting the, uh, on both of those fronts. And the fact the labor movement, which is the 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 absolute bastion of the the fight for economic. Uh, democracy, workplace democracy, is also taking up this fight for political democracy is really, really, really important. And I think it is, you know, is going to make a huge difference. Well, I see strikes taking place, Anita. I see strikes taking place in various locales, you know, there's an upsurge. True. In fact, uh, Kellogg's workers went out. Uh, and then uh, there was another strike. John Deere. Where John Deere? John Deere. There was another strike last week. Uh, um, one was railroad workers. Yep. And then there was a there was a, um that there there was another, and um so that's going on and uh, but I don't see any kick ass things happening at the national level. I really don't. I mean, and um, mm -hmm. so what is up with that? Uh, I can't tell you, but um, but I think it's a really a dangerous situation. Yes, the working, you know, there, there are some groups that are uh, organized, uh, organizing their workplaces and demanding mostly bread and butter issues. Um, and and sometimes equity against these two tier systems that that corporations want to in, in uh, incorporate. But I think our bigger our bigger struggle right now is still going to be a, against fascism. And I I'm really concerned about keeping our electoral uh, you know, activity going because there are 55 uh, Steve Bannon uh, candidates for various uh, state offices across the country that are um, fighting you know, for uh, positions like secretary of state and clerk of courts and things, people that have influence over counting votes. And uh, I, I just see another, um, you know, more, voter su subversion uh, in the future, as well as that uh, voter suppression. 34 states, they passed laws restricting the right to vote, Michael. And well, I, thought, I, I was just going to say the, the same fervor, the same excitement that we saw, you know, now it's been two years ago during the George Floyd rebellion, that's what it's being called, you know, where over two, three, four months, there was just massive uprisings, not only here in the United States, but abroad also in Berlin, London, of all these people who united around it. And it was kind of an anti-systemic fight, you know, fighting against the, the police, you know, uh, how uh, police functions here in the United States. If, if it can be a movement like that, you know, of, of that capacity, united against the struggle against fascism, like we just saw in Chile, people taking to the streets everywhere from the center all the way to the quote unquote far left. You know, that's what it's going to need for, for the fight for voting rights and for the fight against fascism. It has to be that big in order for there to be a change. Well, I mean, I was just going to say, but during the Breonna Taylor, George Floyd uprising, um, and let's not forget Ahmad Arbery. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his name right. The brother that was killed. And, and by the way, that was a good verdict. They put them boys up under the jail <laughs> in Georgia. 
That's where they ought to stay, cowards. Anyway, so, but there was this massive uprising. And then they marched from the ballot box, I'm sorry, from the street to the ballot box. But there's no uprising yet. So, but, go, no. so, Anita? I just want to say that I think it's it's hard to have a national struggle when so many of these um, struggles are really statewide or even, even smaller. I think in Ohio, we have a certain... We're, we're fighting the gerrymandering in, in Georgia. They're fighting uh, to have election officials that um, are uh, promising fair elections. In each state, there's something, there's a different uh, quality to it. So I think that's one reason why it's hard to get a national thing going. And well, that's is. a good point. And, 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 but, and there are struggles. You know, there was a, we said there was a crisis of inaction nationally. But in Georgia, they're fighting. And in Florida, I hear they're fighting. Mm -hmm. South Carolina, they're fighting. And one of the things, Rosanna, we got to figure out, those of us who live in blue states, is how to lend solidarity to what's taking place in the red states and in the, what do you call those mixed states? Purple states? Purple. <laughs> purple. <laughs> Ohio's a purple state. Florida's a purple I state. Um, and Wisconsin's another one. By the way, I heard they had a big meeting in Wisconsin. John Bechtel went the other night, and uh, it seems that the Democratic forces are mobilizing now, getting ready for the November uh, election. Anyway, it looks like we're going to have to combine various forms of struggle. Mm -hmm. and, and, and those of us who live in the blue states, we can do things. I mean, you know, you can take it to some of their funders here in New York. You know, put pressure on them, go to their office, sit in, tell them, we're not leaving until you cut off the funding, you know? Um, and, and so, but it was the same thing, Anita, back in the day now, when they, when they had the Jim Crow laws, they were state laws, mm -hmm. you know, literally, you know, restricting the right to a vote, uh, literally, Literacy tests, poll taxes, grandfather clauses, and all those kinds of things. But there was a national movement because of what was taking place on the ground. True. Um, and so we have to figure out how to how to move. Well, we were in DC, I want us proud to say, and thanks to the <laughs> folks in DC who represented, and also folks from New York went down there too. At least one of them I know went. And, and uh, so we were there, we were representing, and, and we have to keep on doing that. We can't, and we have to join with those who are in struggle at the moment. That's really important. Okay, war no, is well, on I, the agenda. Can I add one more thing here? War, 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 war is on. Okay, Scott, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna Quickly. say to, to, to Anita's earlier point about, um, you know, the, the disconnect between the various sort of uh, fronts of struggle. Um, I think it's important looking at that not to kind of lose hope because all of these, this growing organization, it's all kind of, it all interconnects, it all sort of uh, weaves together and uh, building in the, the, the labor movement also builds strength and fighting capacity in the, the fight against fascism. And so it's, even if we don't exactly see where those points of connection are, they're there and, and they weave together. And let's hope they weave together at that big demonstration in DC called by the Poor People's Campaign in June. What is that date, June? 22nd. June 22nd. 22nd. No, June 18th. Oh, June 18th. Oh, I'm so sorry. June 18th. June 18th. June 18th. June, be there, be square. We're gonna come, we're gonna <laughs> represent uh, big time. But watch out, watch out for us on June. 18th in DC at the Poor People's uh, March. War, rumors of war in Russia, Ukraine. And um, Scott's homeboy, Mr. Biden, his <laughs> next door neighbor said that if there was a little Russian incursion, ah, we're not going to worry about it too much. Was he right about that, <laughs> Michael? I think so. I think we just have to stay out of it. Me, we being the United States in general. Um, 
you know, I've, I was looking into the situation, really, I've been interested in it since 2014, since Russia kind of occupied the Crimea. And it's such a complex situation. It goes back before Soviet times. It goes back really to um, Catherine the Great, you know, who was a German empress of Russia who took the Crimea from the Turks, right? And most of the people living in uh, what is now Crimea, uh, which this is kind of what started the conflict back in 2014, are ethnically Tartar. They're the descendants of Mongolians. And so, you know, there's Ukrainians, there's Russians, there's Tartars, and, you know, borders have changed so many times over the, the past few centuries. We just have to stay out of it. You know, this ramping up NATO, and I understand they released a statement on CNN about a half hour ago saying that not even the Western allies, you know, the NATO allies agree on what can be done about Russia, Ukraine. And so that's the best, you just have to stay out of it. NATO shouldn't even exist. NATO, NATO was built to, you know, counter the, the, the socialist threat from the East, you know, and the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, Warsaw Pact collapsed, you know, 30 years ago, over 30 years ago. And so why does it still exist? Why is it trying to make Russia a threat, you know, when why it's really it expanded, not? in fact? Exactly, exactly. They encircled Russia, haven't they? NATO, you got forward bases. Is that the reason that the, what's the source of this current crisis? Does anybody know? The current one. Has anybody studied it? Um, Joe? Go ahead, I, Anita. I, I understand. I, I have read a little bit about it in um, in the New York Times, for instance, and, and it seems like it, it might be a, just a product of Putin, uh, Vladimir Putin's um, domestic agenda. Um, I, I'm not really sure, but I think, I mean, I think it, it is, uh, you know, that, that that does enter into it, that he, he's playing to his base in, uh, in Russia. Um, but I just want to say also that now the Soviet threat comes from within, from the working class. So, you know, <laughs> we don't have to worry about the Soviet Union anymore. We have to worry about, you know, Kellogg's workers and Starbucks part baristas and there's where the socialist. What Soviet threat from within? I'm not getting that. You're saying. A socialist that. threat. The, you know, the, the specter of socialism coming to, you know, capitalism everywhere. You mean it's coming from I'm Vermont, just seeing, Bernie yeah. Sanders in New York? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe not Bernie, but people. Anyway, um, so the solution, Rosanna, so do you think Biden made that statement on purpose or was he like accidentally on purpose or did he just slip up? Which which statement are you talking well, about? You know, about I might if they go in, you know, limited incursion, we're not going to be all that upset. And, and then they had to. He said that at this press conference that he had, and then they everybody said, "Whoa!" Or at least the Ukraine people in the Ukraine, and then the, the Europeans, and then they had to clarify and say, "Oh no, he didn't mean it." Yeah, and, I think I think it's probably a way to test the waters. Mm. to see what, you know, see the reaction. Um, I mean, they're looking for some war. The, you know, the military industrial complex has to continue their profits. So they're looking for somewhere to, but the people are not, well, you know, especially the people of the U.S. are not buying it. They're not biting, so. And now they're saying that Putin wants to restore the USSR. Soviet and, and we're not going to let them do it. Did you hear that? That's, that's <laughs> utterly false and ridiculous and insulting. <laughs> um, yeah. Based on what I saw in 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 Russia uh, a few years back, yeah. So I, I was there around the occasion of the the hundredth anniversary of the the Bolshevik Revolution, mm -hmm. and what I saw in the the kind of tours of the the Kremlin and things like that was this. Uh, kind of idea of this Russian greatness that stretched across history, right? You had the, the greatness of the Russian empire, and then you had the might of, you know, the Soviet Union, um, um, particularly under Stalin, in fact. And then, you know, Putin is aiming to be the next, you know, presiding over the, the, the next phase of that. So there's, there's a very strong nationalist current, and it looks to me like the imagery, some of the imagery of the Soviet Union in um, kind of Putinist propaganda or whatever is being sucked into a sort of nationalist, Russian nationalist project. 
I think um, it's important. We have to emphasize that Putin's not a member of the Communist Party. You see that, you know, the Democrats say the Republicans, oh, he's a communist. You see him, you know, they put the Soviet hat on him, you know, in the magazines. He's not a communist. So I think we have to clarify that. <laughs> no, you. not by any stretch of the imagination is he. Um, he's an ex-communist. <laughs> a lot of those out there. Uh, but I mean, I think that the um, the whole point is this inter-imperialist rivalry between the U.S. ruling class and the Western European and the EEC and the Russians and and they really can't do much about Russia because they got all those nuclear weapons, you know. And then the the Ukraine they gave them up around the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union. And, and uh, so it's just a big mess. And then there's also the national question, which wasn't solved in the USSR. And so you have all of these inter-ethnic. Anyway, we gotta find out what the Russian communists are saying. And in the Ukraine, is the party outlawed in the Ukraine? It's close to it, they're under severe. It's, it's, and that's it's, kind it's, of right government there too, isn't it? In Parliament. I, huh? I believe it's been disqualified from um, like standing for parliamentary election. But, but it's a really right wing government in the Ukraine and so mm -hmm. on. So we need to find out what they're saying and what, 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 what positions they're taking. That's really, really important. So we're going to come back to that next week. We have some questions before we end from our readers. Does anybody have the questions in front of them? Yeah, why do we why why do we call it Marxism Leninism and not just the original Marxism? Anybody want to take a quick shot at that? Yeah, I, I got a little bit. Okay. Um, so we might as well, we could call it Marxism, we could call it scientific socialism. There are people that prefer either of those terms to Marxism Leninism. Um, uh, the problem with, with Marxism is that there was a, a very concerted campaign. Um, you know, by sort of the cultural forces of capitalism to deform uh, Marxism, to to take it away from you know the actual working class struggle and present it in other forms. So uh, to distinguish that, you know, what we uh, understand, what we teach, what we use as our science is um, the the teachings of uh, the discoveries of Marx and Engels as you know, interpreted by Lenin, uh, that fundamental experience of the, the Russian revolution and all that. So it's, it's to avoid confusion, but, um, you know, scientific socialism is probably the, the cleanest and clearest way of saying it. Okay, anybody else? I think if you take away um, Leninism from, you know, our science, our approach to the class struggle and the democratic struggle, small d democratic struggles, you fall into Bernstein revisionism. I think you fall into um, a lot of these social democratic tendencies of this, what did Bernstein say? Um, the struggle is everything and in the end, nothing, you know, just this constant mm -hmm. reformism and maybe you'll get there, maybe not, you know, and then these Euro communist tendencies that we saw in the, in the 70s and 80s, you know, in Spain, Italy, Movement is everything. Mm. exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so I think to, to take away Lenin's contributions um, to, to like building on the foundations of the scientific socialism as developed by Marx and Engels, you know, I think that's losing uh, the working class approach to these, these specific questions. Anybody else? Well, there's theory, Marx and Engels, and then there's practice. Lenin, Stalin, Mao, Xi Jinping today, Fidel. <laughs> Marx and Engels were also practitioners. Well, yeah, but they didn't Marx build socialism. The, 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 the only first international. successful socialist revolution, well, the Paris Commune, they lasted for 30 days or something like that. But the only success, even with big setbacks, of establishing a socialist revolution was made by the communists who practiced Marxism-Leninism. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's true. It's undeniable. There's no Marxism in this world that doesn't go through Lenin, that's of any merit. And that's why we join them together. And with that, we're going to end. Mm -hmm. Rosanna and I got a meeting right now. <laughs> stay strong, stay safe, stay in the fight. 
And it's uh, one that we can't ignore. I and mean, we got to get deep, knee deep in it. Take care, everybody. Have a great weekend. Bye, everybody. Bye, Bye comrades. Bye.